Station Houston on Space to Ground 2, just a heads up, we're about 30 seconds out from PAO event. We'll be starting on time. Copy, thumbs up. Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? We are ready for the event. KTRK, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Brianna Connor with KTRK. How can you hear me? We hear you loud and clear. How us? We hear you guys as well. You ready? We are ready. Here we go. We like to think Eyewitness News is out of this world, and today we are proving it by having two astronauts currently on board the International Space Station join us to talk about how things are going and what their daily lives are all about. We've got Tracy Dyson and Mark, uh, excuse me, I should say Mike Barrett. First off, I'll ask you, Mike, tell us about the path that led you to STEM and eventually NASA. Well, it's a good question. I think uh, I followed a similar path uh, to a lot of us in the astronaut office and that, you know, we're all kind of fueled by curiosity and, and have diverse interests and really think about the future of, of whatever the field that we really love. You know, for me, I uh, went through my career anxiety starting in high school and I wanted to be an oceanographer and then an astronomer and eventually went into medicine and um, really loved Earth observation. I loved uh, uh, flying and guess where you can put all of that together into one place, one integrated wonderful party, and and that's at NASA. So I think uh, NASA is built for for guys like us, uh, guys and gals like us who are curious and just interested in a lot of things and want to see that all do something positive for the future. Yeah, Tracy, tell us a little bit about your path. Well, I was in high school when I took my first chemistry class and I was hooked. Uh, I loved chemistry because it answered the questions that I had at that point my whole life. And uh, simple things like, why is the sky blue? Why does water boil? What's the difference between a tree and a bush? Those kind of things. And so um, I then decided to pursue chemistry in college. And then it was uh, through my work in uh um, chemistry there that my advisors uh, encouraged me to go to graduate school and to study chemistry even further uh, around along the lines of uh, like like Mike was saying career anxiety uh, when I was a, a junior in high school I was uh, trying to think about what I wanted to do and at the same time the world was our, our nation really was buzzing over something NASA was doing and that was putting a teacher in space and for the first time I'd, I really hadn't thought much about what these astronauts were all about um, just from the right stuff I thought they were all test pilots in the military um, but when I found out that they were sending a teacher into space it got my attention because in high school you know your teachers you, you, you have not just one but six of them probably throughout the day my teachers were my coaches my counselors they were my mentors they meant a lot to me and so to see a teacher uh, going into space as an astronaut was really motivating and like Mike said uh, the, being the curious beans that we are. I looked more into NASA to see what they were doing and at the time they were flying shuttle pretty rigor rigorously but they were also designing the space station and at the time it was called Space Station Freedom but it was not long after that that they were uh, transitioning to the International Space Station where we are now and to make a long story short once I found out about astronauts and what they were doing on the International Space Station um, I made a list of things that I enjoyed doing, and it seemed to match everything that was going on at NASA. So that was kind of the path I took, both uh, with chemistry as well as with NASA. Yeah, I know what it's like to have a curious mind, but journalism was a little bit better of a fit for me. Mike, I want to ask about the experiments that y'all have been working on up there on the ISS. 
The experiments are very, very diverse. You know, we do everything from uh, fluid physics to combustion science to uh, basic biology. And uh, a lot of my favorite ones are the, uh, the human medical experiments because we become such uh, interesting creatures up here. Uh, but mm -hmm. I'll, I'll highlight one that I'm part of, which is the, uh, the Cypher experiment, which, uh, you know, every system in the body changes as it adapts up here, which is it's pretty neat. Um, but all of those adaptations are interdependent on one another. It's a global change, a holistic change. And Cypher is a package of multidisciplinary medical studies that tries to correlate all the changes from one system to another. So what happens in the cardiovascular system might relate to changes that we see in the neurovestibular system or the, the immune system. Uh, so I am uh, one of the subjects of this from my background standpoint and um, my familiarity uh, and friendship with that community. I think that's uh, probably the, one of the more special things uh, that I get to do. And I'll be doing some of that right after this. We'll be looking at my retina. And uh, we have a technique up here we call optical coherence tomography, which takes really detailed looks at the uh, back of your eye, all the layers in there. And the powerful tools like that up here enables us to uh, really push the, the boundaries of physiology, especially in this novel environment. Wow, that is fascinating. Now, this next question is for you, Tracy. As a vet on your third space flight, what, if anything, has been different or surprising this time around? Well, there's, I think, two things that stand out to me. One is, uh, during my, my previous missions, we were assembling the space station. And using the space station as a laboratory was just in the infancy of our program. And so coming back now and the assembly is complete and we are full throttle on utilization and science and technology and demonstrations it's really been a joy um, having a science research background to come here and do science and uh, as well as take care of the space station so that's one of the big differences and i think one of the other pleasantly surprising differences although i don't know how many of my crewmates would agree um, is that the place is a lot more organized than the last time i was here and um and now it's you know because because we were constantly building the space station and it was changing and we hadn't quite really after 10 years even figured out what we needed to make this a well-oiled machine and we were still learning and um, a lot, enough of us have lived up here for six months or more and we've come back and fed um, our, uh, uh, our ideas back as well as all of those that work on the ground to design and operate and help control this space station so we've pulled into our um, creative minds and and have really developed um, a, a more efficient machine up here um, from everything from cargo operations to stowage to how to operate the systems on board the space station and um, makes a lot more room for the science to happen. I could see Mike's face. It certainly looked like he agrees with you, Tracy. Now, we know NASA is working to get astronauts back on the moon with the Artemis mission. So it's successful, Tracy. How do you think that'll shape the national conversation about the merits of space exploration? Well, um, nationally speaking, I think we, um, we're, we're standing on the shoulder of uh, those that made the Apollo program happen. And so there's that level of confidence that um, we know how to get to the moon. And, um, but this time we're going not just to see if we can get there, but to see what we can do once we're there and to sustain our missions at, um, at, um, in the, at the moon. Um, but I think as what makes it a, a conversation um, in our own nation is the international, the, the global, the fact that we're going as planet Earth, um, we're, we're going in a partnership fashion back to the moon and with, um, you know, uh, I guess social media being what it is and information spreading like wildfire, uh, not just throughout our nation, but our whole globe. I think everyone's going to be talking about it because everybody's going to be involved. And I think everyone can see themselves in some, some form or fashion being a part of it. Yeah, Tracy, I think you're right. Now, Mike, we know this is your third trip to the ISS after previously going into orbit in 2009 and 2011. How has each trip differed for you? Has it gotten better each time? Well, you know, each one has its own character. Um, again, I kind of look through a medical physiological lens. When you take your first flight and the engines cut off after ascent, Space starts talking to you real quick, and it reminds you you're in a novel place, 
and uh, you feel that in ways uh, like your sense of balance goes off, so you may get some space motion sickness. Your body fluids mm. redistribute, so you may get some head fullness. You have to learn to navigate in three dimensions, and believe me, people on their first flight tend to bump into things uh, quite a bit. Um, that's just scratching the surface of it. Uh, but your second and third time, you know, space talks to you, but your body starts to talk back. And it says, you know, I've been here before. I remember this. I'm familiar with these conditions. And you adapt quicker. And I certainly did that on uh, this third flight, even though it had been a 12-year gap. So I found that fascinating in and of itself, whether there's something innate uh, that just remembers the zero gravity or whether it's just... Um, thought through cognitive strategies uh, but there is something about repeated flights that um, that make it much easier to uh, pass through those inevitable wickets of adaptation up here uh, to me that's actually one of the most interesting aspects of space flight i love being up here i love floating in zero gravity and uh, there's a lot more wonderful things that go with it but it's a pretty magical place and it was great to get back it certainly sounds like it. It definitely looks like it. Finally, I'll ask you, what is it that makes you want to continue going up into space and learning more? Well, you know, we've been going into space now for, for several decades, and uh, I can honestly say we've still only scratched the surface of what there is to know about systems and how they work in space and how the human adapts to space. And I can say that with confidence because we keep finding new things, big things, physiologic effects that were right in front of our, our faces for years and we just didn't see them. And when you have a laboratory that's well staffed and well equipped, you're, you're able to find things like that. And, uh, you know, we will continue to discover and explore things um, like crazy if we only stay in low Earth orbit. And some of those uh, are helpful to us on the ground in our understanding of basic science. But a lot of them are important in the next steps that we want to take. And uh, to me, that's probably of the greatest interest. Uh, you know, when I, I talk to kids a lot, and uh, often they will say, well, when we go to Mars, we will do this. Or mm, when we go yeah. to another star, what will it look like? It's almost yeah. an absolute inevitability to them, whether it's the, the sci-fi culture or the, the vigorous activity of spaceflight right now on so many different fronts. It's, it's just assumed that we're heading that direction, and that's this generation that's coming. And I think um, building those stepping stones to, to get our civilization out a little bit further and, and really learn about our spaceflight environment, to me, that's, that's the biggest magnet. Hands down, I think I can say this is the biggest conversation I will have all day. Mike Tracy, thank you so much for joining us and for your really interesting insight. It's our pleasure. Thanks so much for your interest and your questions. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes our event. Thank you to all participants. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.